Hello, my friends. Welcome to Origins, a show where we take the evidence of science and use it to validate the truth of creation. My name is Don Chapman. It's my privilege to be your host, and we have a tremendous guest with us today. His name is Dr. Brad Harib. He holds a degree in anatomy and neurobiology from the University of Tennessee School of Medicine. And Brad, today we're going to be really tapping into your expertise in the area of anatomy as we look at the fossil record of man. It's an exciting subject. Some folks don't think that bones are exciting, but I think there is both some incredible assumptions that need to be viewed, and we're digging not only for bones, but for truth here, aren't we? Definitely digging for truth. Uh, you, you can learn quite a bit if you, if you actually take the time to look at the evidence and not just assume and, and use some artistic license, so to speak. Darwin said that if a fossil record didn't validate the transitions that his theory would be proven null and void, didn't he? Darwin was exactly right and I think if Darwin were still living with us today things would be a little bit different as far as what we're teaching in a classroom setting. Uh, in what way would they be different? We still are looking for those missing links. You know, even after decades and decades of digging and searching and, and trying to to apply that beautiful label of a missing link in the fossil story, in the fossil man story, it's still missing. In, in Darwin's days, I read once that uh, we had something like 10,000 fossils in the hands of scientists in those days. Today, that number is in the billions. I don't know if it's in the billions, but I, I do know even with everything we've got, we still can't find a transition. And especially that's true for the one that people are most interested in, which would be the transition in the, uh, in the evolutionary theory from, from apes or monkeys to, to man. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Starting down here at the bottom with uh, a creature called uh, Gyptopithecus zuxus, who uh, according to the evolutionary time scale, he lived 28 million years ago, all the way up to the top uh, modern man. One of the points I, I do want to make before we begin is evolutionists themselves would not necessarily agree on how the, the evolutionary tree of life is put together. So, so basically what I've done is taken the most popular, the most widely represented view, and I'd like for us to look at each branch on that tree. I think that would be great. But before you do that, just let me ask you one general question. The evolutionary tree here starts at 28 million years ago. Do you believe they're uh, dating? Do you believe the numbers on the side of the column? If you think about it for just a moment, all radiometric or radiocarbon dating is based on at least seven different assumptions, two or three of which we know to be false. And I'll give you the, the greatest example. In order for radiocarbon or radiometric dating to be right, we know everything on the earth has to have been uniform from the beginning of history. And if we were to take, for instance, the, uh, a group of people who were fossilized near Mount St. Helens and a group of people who were fossilized, say, in the Pittsburgh area, even though they were living at exactly the same time, covered over with dirt, we come back 100 years later, we dig them up, the individuals up by Mount St. Helens will have been eating and been exposed to more uh, radioactive material simply because of that volcano that exploded. And so even though we're living precisely at the same time, we're going to date at different times. We can say to our people, don't take those years as gospel truth. Absolutely not, because if you think about it for just a moment, a lot of times what they actually do is, is they, they find a, a small fossil in a, in a strato layer, and they say, hey, we think that fossil lived so many years ago, so anything we find in this la layer, we're going to apply that date to. It's, it's circular reasoning at best. All right, with that, will you go to the chart and help us to uh, see just what is the fossil evidence for apes becoming man? Let's start with Egyptopithecus zuxus. Ironically, there's not a whole lot of controversy here. This, this creature allegedly lived 28 million years ago. Richard Leakey and Roger Lewin in their book, Origins, they've already basically given judgment on this particular creature. They said this is the rather monkey-like skull of the Gyptopithecus zuxus, the first ape to emerge from the old world monkey stock. Some elements are partially restored. Now, two things we need to, to note here. When they say partially restored, they're not kidding. Yes. You know, you would think in looking at, at the pictures here that that's really what they have. That's not what they have. Those are filled in models or cast. What they really have are just a few bone fragments and a couple of teeth. The second thing to note is, is its name. Uh, oftentimes we're asked the question, you know, what, what actually links us back to the apes? 
This, they would say, is that creature, the, the linking creature that gets us back to the apes. Not a whole lot of controversy here. This creature, we know beyond the shadow of a doubt, is an ape. Here you see a, an artist's depiction. Actually, you see two of them. What I want you to notice, Don, is how similar they look to each other. Point being, we don't have a clue what this creature really looked like. So this is an artist's concept that has really nothing to do with what the animal really looked like. Precisely. Okay. The only thing that, that we can know for sure is this creature was definitely an ape-like creature, not on its way to becoming human. So there's nothing transitional here, we just have an ape. Precisely. Okay. The next creature on our chart, if we, we work our way up, we, we're at Dryopithecus africanus, uh, the woodland ape from Africa. If we look on the, the screen here, you'll notice beautiful looking skull. Again, some of it's been restored. However, judgment has already been cast on this particular creature too. David Pilbeam has made the comment, he said, this particular creature is too committed to ape them to be the progenitor of man. So again, we just have another skull of an ape, and that's it. Precisely. Another point I ought to make here is the age difference. If we look back on our chart, uh, Egyptopithecus africanus, or Egyptopithecus zuxus started at 28 million years ago, allegedly, using evolutionary time scales. Then we jump up to 20 million years ago with Dryopithecus africanus. That's a, a jump of 8 million years. Now we're going to make another jump of 8 million years. We're going to talk about a creature called Ramopithecus reverostris. Two 8 million year jumps without anything else in the fossil record. This next creature, if you'll notice on the screen, there's not a whole lot to it. You've got some, some mandible, piece of the, the maxilla, piece of the uh, jawbone. How we know a whole lot about this creature from just that little set of bones is beyond me, but this is allegedly what he looked like. If you think for just a moment how many times we look in textbooks we see images just like this where students assume we know the creature has, for instance, a lot of fur, a lot of hair. Or we look on this picture and the, this creature is standing uprightly. Right. How do we know this creature was standing uprightly when all we had to go on was the bones? Three bones. There's nothing there about whether it had a thumb. There's nothing there about the structure of its foot. There's nothing there about any of the things that would make a difference between a man and an ape. Nothing below the neck at all. Richard Leakey, Roger Lewin said, On the right, a reconstruction of Ramapithecus, which, because so few remains have been found, must remain very tentative. Folks, we've only got those three pieces, three bones, three single bones to make up this entire species line. That's it. And yet they're going to tell us that this creature was on its way to becoming human. The next creature on our list, Artipithecus Ramadus Kadaba. He actually made the, the front cover of Time magazine recently. There he is. How apes became human. Now you can imagine how many young people were influenced by that cover of Time. And yet on the right hand side of the screen here you see precisely what fossils they found. We have for instance these are teeth we have a, a toe bone, we have some finger bones. Uh, this particular structure here would be a, a femur, mandible, and some long bones. That's all. That's all they have. Now, from that, I'm reading the subtitle there. What a new discovery tells scientists about how our oldest ancestors stood on two legs and made an evolutionary leap. Forgive my simplicity, but you got a bunch of little pieces, and from that, you could build anything you wanted. You had a picture in your mind of what you wanted it to be. That's precisely correct. And if you think for just a moment about the fact that a lot of young people saw that cover, and then how many of those young people actually read the article where the authors made this admission? They said, Hale Celeste and his colleagues haven't collected enough bones yet to reconstruct with great precision what Kadaba looked like. But they do know that it was about the size of a modern common chimpanzee, which one standing average about four feet tall. Do you know anything from that that makes you know it stood on its hind legs? Well, they actually have a, a toe bone. And in the article itself, they have a caption that says, this toe bone proves the creature walked on two legs. Now, the human foot has 26 bones. They have one. But Don, I want you to read with me another admission they made in that article. They say not only is the toe bone separated in time by several hundred thousand years, but it was also found some 10 miles away from the rest of those bones. Not hundreds of years, hundreds of thousands of years and 10 miles distance so they can well, attach it to something 
way before and put it on the cover of Time magazine and convince your children that they now have the evidence we need for Well, well it, uh, after for all, it, it was a toe bone, so maybe it just walked away. Yeah. <laughs> but, <laughs> okay. but, I mean, you, if you think That's about incredible. it for just a moment, they, all they had were the bones of an ape. Yeah. They had to get this creature upright and walking. So what they did, 10 miles away, they dig up a toe bone, they slap it together with their collection, they say, hey, this proves the creature walked on two legs. And that's all in the fine print that 90% of the people aren't going to read. Precisely. Yeah. If we keep looking on our chart, uh, the next creature is called Kenyanthropus platyops, the flat-faced man of Kenya. And, and that's a great description of him because if you look real carefully at the fossil, you notice it looks like he's been run over by a steamroller. Bear in mind, we've only got just a small handful of bone fragments that supposedly makes up an entire family line, a branch of our family tree. An exhaustive study of the Nature article reveals a total of 36 craniodental fossils, that is, bone and, and teeth fossils, collected from four different locations over a period of 17 years in which only six contain bone fragments. The authors describe their new finds as a well-preserved temporal bone, two partial maxilla bones, isolated teeth, and most importantly, a largely complete, although distorted, cranium. Don, when you look at that particular fossil, would you say it's a little distorted? I would say it's very distorted. How you would possibly put that together and say we know what this man looked like is beyond my comprehension. And think about it. If you have spent 17 years of your life trying to find a missing link, it's awful easy to read something into something. It sure is. We keep looking on the chart, moving our way up. Well, this actually here is a, a picture of what Mr. Kenyanthropus platyops is supposed to look like, flat-faced man of Kenya. And, you know, sadly, when our young people, when they see an image just like that, they assume that National Geographic just ran out with their, their handy-dandy camera, took a picture of this creature in the long ago. But they have them pondering and thinking like <laughs> it's a great... Uh... The next one is probably the most popular of all the missing links. Uh, Australopithecus afarensis, better known as Lucy, and uh, I suspect Lucy. most of the viewers out there have heard of Lucy. She is the most famous of all the missing links. When Lucy was first put on the scene, there was a lot of pomp, a lot of flair, but nobody came back around after we'd had time to look at the bones, take measurements, and actually do scientific studies. Nobody came back around to give what Paul Harvey likes to say the rest of the story, and I want to share just a couple of points with you about Lucy. Here you see an artist's depiction of what she or he supposedly looks like, and yet we know today Lucy was nothing more than an ape. If we look at her fingers, her limbs, they match precisely to what an ape would look like. Number two on the, the screen here, you notice it says locked wrist. Two fellows, Brian Richmond and David Strait, realized they were up in the Smithsonian Institute looking at old primate papers and they, they found one that talked about primates having the ability to lock their wrists. Yes. Now, they hadn't seen anything written about that in the human fossil record, so they went literally down the hall to where there was a Lucy replica, and lo and behold, they realized Lucy has locking wrists. In fact, Maggie Fox made a comment on it. She said, a chance discovery made by looking at a cast of the bones of Lucy. The most famous fossil of Australopithecus afarensis shows that her wrist is stiff, like a chimpanzee's. This suggests that her ancestors walked on their knuckles. When they first presented Lucy, they said, hey, she has a barrel-shaped ribcage. She's on her way to becoming human. But I want you to read uh, one of the comments made by Peter Schmidt after they shipped him a replica of Lucy. He said, when I started to put the skeleton together, I expected it to look human. Everyone had talked about Lucy being very modern, very human, so I was surprised by what I saw. I noticed that the ribs were more round in cross-section, more like what you see in apes. Human ribs are flatter in cross-section, but the shape of the ribcage itself was the biggest surprise of all. The human ribcage is barrel-shaped, and I just couldn't get Lucy's ribs to fit this kind of shape. But I could get them to make a conical-shaped ribcage like what you see in apes. Probably one of the most important finds was discovered by one of the, the famous paleontologists, the Leakey family, Mary, and it's called the Laetoli Footprints. Here you see a picture of Mary. She's measuring these footprints. This is from National Geographic several years ago, 1979. What I want you to notice, Don, is, is those particular footprints 
It's not just a single set. The importance being, there's a child's set of footprints in this picture. Now, this is the picture that was included in National Geographic, and you'll notice they have these ape-like creatures, and one of them is holding an infant. And you think, why in the world did the artist draw that particular picture? Here's the reasoning. Mary Leakey, in describing it, said, The prints in one of the trails did indeed turn out to be double. I'll simply summarize here by saying that we appear to have prints left three and a half million years ago by three individuals of a different stature. It's tempting to see them as a man, a woman, and a child. The problem with that is there's nothing that has ever done that except modern human beings. But they have already labeled this thing as 3.5 million years old. So Mary Leakey, she was stuck. She actually gave this thing scientific name Homo, which is what we are, but the species was indeterminate. That is, we don't know. Russell Tuttle, who had been invited by Mary Leakey to study the footprints, wrote, a barefoot Homo sapiens could have made them. He said, in all dis discernible morphological features, the feet of the individuals that made the trails are indistinguishable from those of modern man. So we have uh, human footprints is basically what you're saying. And, and the date is significant because that makes it older than Lucy? That's the catch they're in. Yes. How do you have, I mean, he's basically saying a human, a, a homo sapien could have made them, but they won't take that step because they had already dated the act. So, so you've got the human before the missing link. That's right. Okay. <laughs> Donald Johansson, the, the discoverer of Lucy, said, make no mistake about it. They're like modern human footprints. If one were left in the sand of a California beach today and a four-year-old were asked what it was, he would instantly say that somebody had walked there. He wouldn't be able to tell a hundred other prints on the beach, nor would you. And because of their pre We're talking about the fossil record of man. And uh, Dr. Brad, uh, right before the break, we were talking about the kind of uh, corner that the evolutionists have painted themselves in by having human footprints uh, half a million years before uh, Lucy, which is supposed to be their transitional uh, piece. Uh, a bit of a dilemma. Now, what's next on the chart here for us? The next creature that we've got on our chart is Homo habilis. And if you look there on the screen, uh, it's, this is one of the most famous controversial ones. This is found by Richard Leakey. It's designated KNM or Kenya National Museum 1470 and on the next screen you'll see a, an artist depiction of what this alleged ape-like creature looked like. It's always easy to get somebody to, to throw in some hair and make them look like a, a cave kind of creature. On the, the screen now you'll notice on the right those are the actual fossils we have for this creature and yet from just a, a few fragments of bone, we get a whole entire family. I'm of counting seven fossils there, seven little pieces of bone. And from that, they have drawn all of those pictures. You get a whole family line. Wow. <laughs> We're going to hold off on Homo habilis for just a moment and go to the next creature, Homo erectus, which is right before humans, Homo sapiens, according to the evolutionary timeline. On the screen, you're seeing a, a skull of what, uh, of, there again, partially restored skull of Homo erectus and then an artist's depiction of what this cave-like creature would look like. 
The point to make on Homo erectus is you can't really tell a difference between them and us. Uh, Ernst Mayer, a very famous evolutionary taxonomist, said the Homo erectus stage is characterized by a body skeleton which, so far as we know, does not differ from that of modern man in any essential point. Uh, David Pilbeam said Homo erectus found throughout the old world during much of the Middle Pleistocene is barely distinguishable taxonomically from Homo sapiens. So we just have here fossils of human beings. Precisely. There's no, no major difference between Homo sapiens and the, the Homo erectus stage. Now here's the important point though. Mary Leakey discovered the remains of a circular stone hut at the bottom of bed one in Old Divide Gorge beneath fossils of Homo habilis. Evolutionists have long attributed the deliberate manufacture of shelter only to one species and that's Homo sapiens. So we have a shelter below Homo habilis. And yet, you know, that, that tells me quite a bit about our chart. If you look on it for just a moment, these first three we've already talked about, they were far too committed to apedom. We go on up the chart and we realize these are nothing but apes, apes, until you get to Homo habilis, where we've got a, a circular stone hut telling us human, human beings. Human beings lived here and built their homes here. So you've got a clear line across there. Draw a line for us between sure. apes and, and man. There. If you look on this chart, it's pretty obvious. Everything above the line is nothing but a variation of human skeletal features. Now, Don, I'm sure you're aware, if, if somebody has, for instance, a, a bone disorder such as rickets or, or advanced stages of arthritis, they're going to have variations in their, their skeletal structure. Certainly. So is it possible that some of the variations we look at and we find are are by environmental conditions of fossilization or by uh, bone disorders. Yeah. Certainly. In fact, in, in any large gathering today, we look out at a population of people, we see people with big heads, little heads, short heads, fat heads, but that doesn't mean that something was a, a Neanderthal-like creature. Not at all. And, and so what we have to say is that uh, probably given diet back then, there would have been even more variation than there is today because uh, probably right. they weren't eating healthy foods or balanced diets, and so you would have more deformities. You are right. Let me show you one last quote. Uh, Jeremy Rifkin, when asked what the fossil record really shows, I think he, he summed it up very well when he said, what the fossil record shows is nearly a century of fudging and finagling by scientists attempting to force various fossil morsels and fragments to conform with Darwin's notions, all to no avail. He said, today the millions of fossils stand as very visible, ever-present reminders of the paltriness of the arguments and the overall shabbiness of the theory that marches under the banner of evolution. Do you see in this evolutionary tree of the history of man one shred of evidence for a missing link between apes and man? Oh, it's not just the missing link that's missing. The entire chain is missing. We have apes, we have man, we don't have a chain connecting them. You know, one of the things that comes to me is that they want to find a missing link. What they never want us to find is God's marvelous creation. You know, folks, I hope that you will understand, as we have wonderful guests like Dr. Brad, that science is not versus God. God is the author of science. And God has shown us very clearly that man is fearfully and wonderfully made in his image and distinct from all the rest of God's creation. Nothing that science has unveiled will ever dispute the fact that God made you and made you special and made you in his image to know him, to love him, to be his very own. I hope that today's uh, uh, program will be something that has opened your eyes to look and to think and to seek God's truth. You know, there's a lot of facts that we give you, and, and they're all true, and this information is helpful. I hope it has been something God's used to prod you to thinking. But there's one thing I'm sure of that I never want you to lose sight of, and that's this, that it's God's view that he created you, and that should be your worldview too. I hope you'll join us again as we continue to search for God's truth and how it relates to creation. God bless you.
you for watching this edition of Origins. To get a copy of the information presented today, you can download a PDF file of program number 1101 from our website at www.originstv.org. Or for a DVD of this series, send a $12 donation to cover shipping and handling and write to Origins, program number 1101, Cornerstone Television, Wall, Pennsylvania, 15148. Origins is made possible by the faithful prayers and the financial support of you, our Cornerstone Television family.